Um, so first of all, I'm delighted that we're actually finally getting the opportunity to discuss this bill as for ourselves anyway, it's been a long time um, in the making. And it was prompted by the Mother and Baby Homes report um, that was published finally on the 12th of January 2021, having started up in 2015. So that was a huge amount of time for people to have to wait. And over the following days, weeks and months, we all expressed our absolute shock at its contents, at its contents, our disgust that it had been leaked days previous to publication, which was a huge insult to those survivors. Um, and so many survivors had so much expectation and maybe optimism that this report would right some wrongs, that it would hold those responsible for so much hurt and for so much injustice, that it would open up honest and truthful dialogue on a shameful chapter in our history and begin a process of healing for survivors and for their families. Unfortunately, that is not what happened. Instead, what we got was a report whose particular findings stated that there was a lack of evidence regarding forced adoptions, abuse and discrimination despite testimonies contradicting this. And I just give that as a bit of background to what prompted me to, I suppose, bring this forward, this, this particular piece of legislation that we're talking about today. Um, I also would like at this point as well to say that we've spent about two years back and forth with this bill and um, with the office of the OPLA and I want to thank them for their absolute the work that they did on this, for their professional guidance um, and for all their support in drafting this. And I think it's important because I just have a feeling um, that I had hoped that this would be supported and I've just heard some news uh, contrary to that that the government is not going to support it. So I do want to stress this particular point. Under the proposed legislation, former members of commissions could, could be compelled to appear before a committee within six months of the publication of their final report. It is to ensure future commission members cannot simply discharge their duties upon submission of their final report without a certain level of rock scrutiny. On foot of ongoing criticism of the mother and baby report, as people will know in this chamber, and I think we were all in agreement at the time, we invited the members of that commission to appear before the Children's Committee as the relevant committee. Um, and as we all know, they, they denied that or they denied the invitation on several occasions, which prompted huge anger and outbursts, particularly because the members of that commission chose themselves then to go and speak publicly about the situation, which certainly added a uh, salt um, into the wound. In December 2021, the state acknowledged that survivors' rights were breached when they were not given a draft of the final report prior to its publication. And we cannot in good conscience allow this level of unaccountability to ever be repeated again, nor can we stand over it. So I am, Minister, acutely aware that commissions must remain independent, and that's the point I want to stress, because this is not about... Um, you know, jeopardising that independence. And there was a huge amount of back and forth and how this could actually be achieved without jeopardising that independence. And this is why I've set out matters that are or may be the subject of court proceedings, matters relating to any facts established by the Commission, certain matters relating to persons who are not identified in or identifiable from the final report, and matters relating to evidence that is confidential that committee members will have to shy away from. Our bill will mandate for the appropriate examination by elected representatives to scrutinise the terms of reference and methodology. And they're the two sections that we would um, kind of hone in on, particularly because we do acknowledge the independence and that's, that's a crucial part of it. However, we can't have a situation, and I don't see how anyone could, could agree with what happened with the mother and baby situation, where we had, first of all, the length of time that it took um, and then the fact that the report was leaked, there were so many different situations that, that failed survivors of the, of the institutions. But then we had a situation where there was huge outcry over the report. And really what it came down to was the terms of reference. And it felt like what was in the report didn't match the terms of reference and the methodology. And they're the parts that we would like to be able to ask uh, commission members once they have finalised their report. Um, and like, as I said, I don't think anyone could actually stand over what happened that time where there was no uh, level of accountability. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that government would have said the same as well, that, th that they should have come before the, co the Children's Committee at that time to answer questions. And then also for them to, to go and speak about it publicly themselves was just shameful. This legislation, uh, if uh, approved, will amend Section 2 of the Act in which we set out what format said scrutiny would take in the event of a dispute as to whether a former member is required to give account in respect of a particular matter. The section further provides for the referral of that dispute to the High Court for determination. 
So obviously, Minister, what I would like to see is that this bill is passed, and I actually had as one of my concluding paragraphs that it wouldn't be left to die in committee stage, as I had hoped, maybe naively, and after eight years being in here, maybe that was a, a bit stupid on my part, but I really did think there would be support for this bill. We're not looking to interfere with the independence. We're not looking to uh, jeopardise that in any way, shape or form, but we are looking for accountability at the end of a commission of investigation. I mean, the state pays huge money in these situations to get answers and to get some form of justice for survivors. And to have a situation where there's indefinite timeframes, timeframes are not adhered to, and then the, the methodology and the terms of reference clearly don't seem to have been adhered to. I don't think it's unreasonable to ask that there's questions asked of that once the report is finalized and once it's, their work is done. And I also think you know, that it, it changes the way that commissions of investigations might be carried out in the future in terms of, I don't think it's any harm for, there to, for people to, to think that there could be scrutiny or there could be examination of this, there could be some level of responsibility and accountability, because otherwise that process really is not fit for purpose. And we can't have a situation where we could potentially repeat what happened with the mother and baby institutions. You know, it was just horrific uh, what happened to people who went in, who told their stories, very personal stories, and then saw on the page that there was account after account, for example, of uh, women not understanding that they were signing adoption papers, and yet a finding comes out that there was no evidence to force adoptions. Like, that's just an example of, surely someone should be able to say, well, how, how did that happen? How did you, you reach that conclusion, given that this is your evidence and then this is your finding? I don't think that's unreasonable. I don't think that interferes with the process. And I think if we're not going to support this, we need to look at how we change commissions of investigations so that that does not happen again. I, I, one of the, the, the few times I was so angry was during that whole situation to think that there was no way of actually getting some level of justice for all of those, mainly women, but, but also um, men as well. And that is why we went and we looked into this, did huge amounts of work back and forth. The OPLA, as I said, were fantastic. Emma, who works with me in my own office, was fantastic and was a huge driver of this as well. So, I mean, if someone says this can't be done, well, someone tell me then what can we do? Because we certainly have to do something. We can't leave it as is. I mean, it is legislation that's in place since 2004. I don't think it's unreasonable for any of us to say it needs to be reviewed, it needs to be looked at, and we need to see how we can change it. And I, if it is the case that the government is planning not to support this, I would appeal to you to look at that decision again and, and allow this maybe to go to committee stage and tease out what we can do. Because certainly for any group that potentially has to face a commission of investigation, which of course none of us want that, but that's not the reality of life and we also know that. But we can't have them go into that process um, with a never-ending time frame and a report that if we're all being very honest with ourselves and take off our political hats for a minute, nobody could honestly say that that report was fit for purpose. So that's um, really what I want to say on it, Kian Corla. I would appeal for support first and I'll pass over to my colleague. Thank you for here looking. Thank you, deputies. In particular, thank you to Deputy Punchin for tabling this legislation and uh, allowing us to have this debate tonight. The bill, as you've said, proposes to amend the Commission of Investigation Act 2004 to require former members of a Commission of Investigation upon written request to appear before the relevant Oireachtas Joint Committee within six months after the presentation of the Commission's final report. Um, while I go briefly through some of the key elements of the Investigations Act, which I think are relevant in considering this bill, um, I do want to say at the outset that I do agree and I do believe that there may be times uh, following publication of certain commissions of investigation where it's appropriate for the chair perhaps in particular to uh, make a public statement or to provide an explanation or clarification and I do think that is appropriate uh, particularly in terms of avoiding confusion in making sure that we maintain public confidence in the process itself uh, but also making sure that those who are involved in the commission as well that they have confidence in it uh, but I do believe that it should be a matter for the chair themselves or else for the minister at the time who is setting out the terms of reference to say that very clearly and we know that that has happened in previous commissions of investigation where that has been set out clearly in the terms of reference and that is something that has happened and where there has been public commentary and there has been clarification. Um, I acknowledge uh, and I note, uh, as you've just outlined, Deputy Function, the, the reason behind proposing this, uh, and I don't for a second doubt your reason behind putting this legislation forward. Uh, you've obviously uh, been very much to the fore of this in terms of your own chairing 
the committee uh, and your involvement in it with many of my own colleagues and, and obviously Minister O'Gorman working with you. Um, obviously, the Cahirlach yourself had requested at several stages that the Commission would come before the Commission. At that stage, it had been resolved. Uh, and I think there has been an acknowledgement by Minister O'Gorman and others that many people, but in particular survivors, had been left very disappointed by the fact um, that... I suppose particular aspects of the report, particularly the tone and the language that had been used in the summary, that they hadn't been able to get clarification or, or ascertain what they felt were the facts. And I suppose I would take this opportunity to say that I understand their feeling of disappointment in that regard. Um, it, it doesn't change the fact, though, that in setting out the Commission of Investigation, the primary function is to establish the factual position about the matter under investigation. And I know that we talk about getting justice for people, but we have to be clear that it's about setting out the facts and that hopefully that will in turn provide some level of comfort or justice for people, but that might not be the case either. So it has to be absolutely clear that the establishment of a commission is to report on matters of significant public concern, that it's to establish a factual position, but as you set out yourself as well, that it remains completely independent at every stage. And I suppose that is where the challenges are and that they have arisen in relation to this particular bill itself. So maybe just to outline some of the challenges um, a commission established under the Commission of Investigation is required to act independently to conduct its investigation in accordance with fair procedures. This requires it to respect important legal principles that ensure relevant persons obtain the fair hearing and an opportunity to reply to evidence affecting them and their good name. The chairing of commissions is entrusted to persons, usually judges uh, or former judges and senior lawyers, with the skills and the expertise to ensure that those legal principles are upheld in the conduct of the commission's work and in the writing of its report. It operates in a carefully controlled environment and aims to produce a carefully balanced report that can withstand legal challenge before the courts. Section 35 of the Act provides that a draft report may be amended for reasons relating to a failure to observe fair procedure, and that is set out uh, in Section 5 of the Act. When a Commission finishes its report, it has no further authority to act requiring a member of a commission to come before an Oireachtas committee in the way that is suggested in the bill, uh, I don't believe it would be appropriate. I think it carries considerable risk to the principles of fair procedure to take the issue out of what is intended very clearly to be a controlled environment where the rights of participants in particular are protected uh, and to potentially reopen them in an environment that is not, uh, I suppose, to that sense, carefully controlled um, it can potentially reopen uh, some of the challenges and the rights of the participants could be at risk. Uh, Section 9 of the Commissions of Inquiry Act 2004 provides that a Commission shall be independent in the performance of its functions. Section 10 of the Act provides that a Commission may, subject to the Act and the Commission's rules and procedures, conduct its investigation in the manner that it considers appropriate in the circumstances of the case. The proposal in the Bill to require a former member to give account to an Oireachtas Committee is not compatible with these particular provisions of the 2004 for Act. In terms of separation of powers, it's sometimes the case, as I've mentioned, that members of a commission consist of a member of the judiciary, or in fact they may be the sole member, or they may be chairing. In the event that such a person were to appear before an Oireachtas committee, it's inevitable that there would be difficulties arising in relation to the separation of powers, which is, of course, a key element of the constitutional framework of Ireland. Deputies need to consider this issue carefully before agreeing that the Oireachtas would enact legislation which could potentially give rise to difficulties in that regard. The bill also proposes that a former member of a commission shall not be required to give account in relation to a number of specific matters, including any facts established by a commission, uh, and you said yourself there, Deputy, uh, specifically in relation to mother and baby homes around uh, establishment and facts and how things were reached in terms of the final conclusion. If you can't talk about the facts established, information concerning any person who has identified and evidence given to the Commission in confidence, because of that exclusion, members of the Oireachtas Committee would have great difficulty in asking questions of any value while complying with the Bill. Section 32 of the 2004 Act provides that a Commission shall prepare a written report based on the evidence received by it, setting out the facts it established in relation to the matters referred to it for investigation, where a Commission considers that the facts relating to a particular issue have not been established. The Commission shall identify the issue. It may indicate its opinion to the quality, the weight of any evidence relating to the issue. So in light of this provision, it is reasonable, I think, to conclude that the report of a Commission would deal as comprehensively as possible with the matter under investigation and that, consequently, there would be nothing further for a further, further member of a Commission to add in the context of giving account to an Oireachtas Committee. 
The bill is based on the idea that a commission of investigation is to be accountable to, to a committee appointed jointly by both houses of the Oireachtas. The 2004 Act provides for the establishment of a commission which is to be independent in carrying out its functions. It is to be the independence of the government and also the relevant minister responsible for overseeing administrative matters relating to the establishment of the commission. And again, the proposals in this bill would not be compatible with this requirement for independence. So to conclude, it is for these reasons I've set out. I, I, I do want to stress again, I absolutely appreciate and understand the rationale behind the proposals here. And I again would repeat, I do believe that there should be times where there are clarifications needed, where there are uh, issues that should be uh, set out and explained, particularly where it avoids confusion, but to make sure that there is confidence maintained uh, in this process. Uh, and I think that's something that can be done and should be done through uh, the minister or through the chair when setting out the terms of reference. Uh, but for the reasons that I've outlined, I believe that there could be a potential implication for commissions themselves if you were to potentially have a line being crossed where that independence is in any way being jeopardised, not just the structure itself, the potential then for the environment to have implications for those who've contributed to uh, what is a very controlled environment and, and the, the commission itself, the process, but also where you have members of the judiciary as well who are more likely to be a chair if they were to become before the committee, the challenges that arise there. But perhaps there's a way we could engage jeopardy to see how we could make sure that something that has happened previously, as you've outlined, where I do understand the disappointment um, and the manner in which some of it was dealt with, which wasn't, it wasn't fair to, to those who put themselves forward and took part in the commission, that we could make clear that there is a way forward, that that type of clarification could be provided in the future, and that something like this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Deputy Function to conclude. Uh, thanks, Cahirlach, and thanks, Minister. And I appreciate... Um, your own comments in relation to how the, the whole mother and baby situation was handled. Um, I, yeah, if there is some possibility, like I take on board what you're saying in relation to setting out a statement. Now I have to say, um, and you won't be surprised, like just because of the level of work, that, particularly with the involvement of the OPLA, I don't see the, the difficulties that you're outlining with the bill. But rather than rehashing that, if there is some way that we can look at amending the legislation in terms of, I know what you're saying, that sometimes it's in the terms of reference, but maybe we can, is there a way of putting it in that it has to be a part of the terms of reference or, or something? Um, and if we can get a commitment that we can work on that, um, I think that would be good because we basically just don't want a situation where this, what happened already happened and just to, like, you're saying the commission investigation, like they have to come up with, like it's a factual situation. But if you do look at the example I gave in relation to the forced adoptions, it's just one part of it. But I think it's one of the most clear ones where it was so obvious that the finding really contradicted the evidence that they provided themselves. And I would say that if they're setting out factually that this is what they found from speaking to women, but then their finding is different. It's those type of things. Um, again, not to be repeating myself, but it's not to interfere with that independence. It's to actually not allow a situation where so much time, effort and energy has gone into a report. Everyone's waiting for it. It comes out and, every, and everyone is, is left with far more uh, questions. And for those that are directly involved, for those that were telling their lived experience, not only are they left with more questions, but far more hurt and far more upset and far more anger. So... If there is a possibility of us looking at this, I would like to explore that. Um, and just separate to that then, um, as I said at the start, the whole reason for this was my own involvement with so many uh, women. And I just kind of want to acknowledge them there today. Just, I never fail to be surprised um, by the amount of women that have come forward to tell their story. That so many women that it turns out that I even knew that you wouldn't realise that they maybe had their own story to tell. And it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and it was a very, very difficult situation. There's so many women still trying to find children that are clearly well into their 40s and 50s at this point and still haven't been able to find them. And same for adult children trying to find their mothers. And I just think, particularly as a mother, it's just devastating and it's heartbreaking. And to think that... We, you know, we can't go back into the past and change that situation, but certainly when it comes to what we can do going forward and trying to achieve, like whether it's setting out the factual situation of what happened to them, but there's always going to be a level of justice expected in that. 
Um, I just think we need to do that to our absolute best ability. And it, it is legislation, as I said, that's there since 2004. I don't think it's... Um, you know, too demanding to ask that that be reviewed, that we look at how we can make some sort of positive changes to it. And I would like to, to get a commitment on that. Um, and that's, I'll leave it at that, uh, Cahir Lock. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy. So that concludes the debate. And um, the question now is that the bill be read a second time. So, Natyakti Atar Haven Nageshta Abadish Ta. So, deputies in favour of the question say Ta. Ta. Tactic at High Gwina, Abadish, Neil. Deputies who are against, say Neil. Neil. Shiram Gwilan Gwil Buta and Gesh. So in my opinion, the question is defeated. Votal. Votal. So a division has been called. The division is postponed until the weekly division time next week.